And we're live. Over to Jonathan. Introduce. Okay, my name is Jonathan. You all know me. You all know Ben. This is Maya. She's a tape four. And this is Tom Condon, author of what's the book again? The Enneagram Movie and Video Guide 3.0. Uh, and that's what we're going to discuss today. Obviously, Tom is uh, he's been on before and he's uh, decades of experience on the Enneagram and NLP, but he also has wrote a few books and one of them in particular is a bit unusual as far as Enneagram books go. It's about he was reviewing hundreds of different movies and analysing the Enneagram types of the characters. So, yeah, how about you start by telling us how you started writing that? Well, it was back in 1992, and mm -hmm. there was a uh, one Enneagram publication in those days, and it was called uh, The Enneagram Educator. And I began to write for them, and it, it was partially because I had an epiphany one day where I was thinking a lot about the Enneagram, and I watched Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, mm -hmm. the original. Uh, from the 1930s, and it, Dr. Jekyll was a one, and Mr. Hyde was a, a seven with an eight wing, and it was so obvious, it just blew my mind. And what it then occurred to me was, what then occurred to me was that you could use film, at least as a medium, for helping people get better at recognizing Enneagram styles. Because the two, it seemed to me, the two problems with the Enneagram were getting good at it and uh, recognizing other people's Enneagram styles as well as your own, and then what to do with it once you knew about your Enneagram style and especially the limitations of it, what would be good solutions, what would be uh, appropriate methods or practices to, to uh, adopt. And those were the two things I was confronting as I taught workshops in the Enneagram. And so I thought that the movies especially would be an entertaining way to learn about Enneagram styles. And they would be sort of a substitute for uh, a style of learning about the Enneagram that still goes on, which is where a teacher will gather panelists and a bunch of people with the same Enneagram style. And then, you know, kind of accentuate how they're the same and how they're different. I thought if you had movies at your disposal that had real clear, vivid examples of Enneagram styles, that you could make your own panels that way and wouldn't, wouldn't really have to go to a workshop. So that's how it started. And the first edition of the book came out about 1994. Then there was a second edition in 1999 and a third one a couple of years ago. And I'm sort of working on a fourth one now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I've read it. It's quite good. Uh, I, like, I like the idea that uh, it's good for showing in particular the different... It's good when you watch different adaptations of the same story, I find, that... Uh, you, that's good for figuring out people's enneagrams because you'll see the personality changes even though the character in general is the same. I mean, you're you're talking about Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde, and Jekyll being a one and Hyde being in a seven wing eight. Because I think actually in the original story, I actually think Jekyll is more of a five, uh, and Hyde might be a seven or might be an eight because he's less morally focused and more just about. He's worried about the societal shame rather than anything else and this is privacy. So, uh, yeah. I mean, this also begins to intersect with the, uh, the author's Enneagram style. And yeah. if I did some research on Stevenson and was convinced he was a seven. Yeah. And so totally. a seven has a built-in connection to one and then my version of things, a built-in connection to eight. Hmm. And that the same goes for actors sometimes. Once you know the actors' enneagram styles, 
an actor's Enneagram style, you can see patterns in the roles that they play and choose, especially if they're well known and they have more options than uh, an actor who's just coming up who needs to just take any job they can. Um, I'll just say that that can vary by vary by a lot by the school of acting that, that they employ, like just that the, the, the degree to how much they use their own experience. And so you could well, also also it varies sometimes with uh, um, whether somebody is a character actor or let's say a movie star, a personality actor. Uh, there's there's quite a few of both, and a character actor can really jump and do a lot of different enneagram styles, uh, whereas a, a a movie star is more usually more limited. They usually don't have as much range. They're playing a variation of themselves or or maybe yes. a wing or you know something something that they're yes. closely connected to. I've mentioned this sometimes in some hangouts before, but what people can do, what some actors and actresses can do is sometimes that they can like you people have heard of like method acting, but there's also like the system and people something using something like emotion memory where like say they're in a scene and like they're breaking down and they're crying and they will take something from their own memory and channel that uh, to get to that state to, to the, produce it and so a lot of them may like if they're that kind of actor or actress like choose roles that are a lot like them well find it easier if they're really method preoccupied in the way you're describing they might not the, the films they're in might not reveal Enneagram styles. And not a lot of them do, I say. Uh, you have somebody like Clint Eastwood, for example, who's a, uh, in, in real life, as far as I can tell, a nine with an eight wing. And he plays eights, and he plays nines, and he plays eights, mm -hmm. and he plays nines. Michael Douglas does the same thing, goes back and forth. And, uh, so you see that a lot. Or you see somebody like uh, Tom Cruise or Arnold Schwarzenegger. They actually can't really act, but they yeah. can. <laughs> well, but, and I'll tell you, Tom, I mean, because I've seen because my mother was a generalization that I came up with, yeah. which is that threes can't act. Yeah. Um, but what they, I'm saying. They can play threes really yeah. well. I'll just say something about Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood is somebody who got a lot better as an actor. Like, if you you may have seen him, Tom, in like Rawhide, where he he does not. I've, even, I've seen him for forty years. He's, yeah, uh, it, he's it, was, good. it was not such a good actor in Rawhide, and then he got a little bit better, like when he did the Dirty Harry movies, right? Over the years, that's, that's when he started to to uh, become a movie star. Yeah, so there's basically typecasting going on. <laughs> yeah, I called it any a typecasting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, not always, but uh, but but certainly some of the time. And then a lot of films, because of the way they're made, and because of the way they're written, especially the role is written, they don't really have an enneagram style in them, or they have a kind of. They're alluding to an Enneagram style, but it's not vivid enough to really point out to somebody who's learning about the Enneagram. It's, it's just not all there. They're not really s seeming to be that style and saying it and their motivation is consistent, stuff like that. So what, unfortunately, what this meant was watching a lot of movies and a lot I didn't really care for very much. Uh, because it's just not in a lot of films, but when it's there, it's really there. If you're if you're choosy and picky about it. Tom, uh, something I mentioned to Catherine is, um, uh, and, and something I learned from Robert McKee is that in the 1970s, a style of film became very popular for winning Oscars, and and Robert McKee called it the redemption plot, and it was sort of written by writers to sort of like criticize the sort of like the values of the day. Right, and it was almost like an anti E3 uh, message where someone would like pursue success right. and like, become a, it would become like a soul corrupting fixation. And they sort of realize that it's corrupting them and they, it's like, and they stop it, <laughs> they decide not to 
go for success, and so they win by losing. Right. They win by quitting. Yeah, uh, Tom Cruise has done a few of those, actually. Yeah, in Main Man. <laughs> they don't do as many now, I think, because m movies are more expensive. But uh, <laughs> back in the 70s, they were, yeah. they were cheaper to make, and people would uh, yeah. take bigger risks, I think. Especially <laughs> the independent films. Well, nowadays, I think they've got the twist where they do the redemption thing and they realize it's so crushing, but they go along with it anyway. Like, they, they do that in the, the film Whiplash and they do that in other films where basically they said, yes, as I am going to lose my soul, I am going to lose all my friends, it's worth it. I'm going to get rich, which... Ah. Yeah, I don't know what the moral... Apparently, you want the key calls that the punitive plot where the person goes through with it. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I also wonder what it says about, you know, really successful Hollywood screenwriters that keep writing these plots where, you know, successful people get punished. Um, one thing I'll say, there's one film that was looked at a lot of different ways, and Tom, you'll remember this a lot, and that was the film Wall Street, where people looked, just looked at that film from lots of different points of view. What do you think well, of that Well, yeah. Uh, I thought he, Michael Douglas was playing an eight in that. Mm. And he was modeled on a man named Ivan Boski, who also was an eight. And Charlie Sheen was kind of playing a three, I thought. And it was about junk values and corruption and, you know. And I, I thought that was, a good, that was a good film for demonstrating a certain kind of uh, expression of a couple of Enneagram styles. But, but there were a lot of people that, like, when they saw the film, they may have been eights themselves, but, like, they liked the, Michael Douglas's character and they, like, took him as a role model. And the INFP is, yeah. sorry, the other types, like, <laughs> Enneagram, like, other Enneagrams would be like, you know, you're misunderstanding the point of the film. Yeah, yeah that's right. And that uh, greed is good, that famous speech that uh, people picked up on that. It was in the 1980s in America, and it kind of reflected... A, a cultural atmosphere, I thought. But I, I think actually think that speech was very well written, where he actually goes that this is what greed is, and it's like that's a very well balanced speech. So yeah, you see that also with the film Glengarry Glen Ross, which mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think Tom says that's got a lot of threes in it, but there's also Alec Baldwin's tape eight character. He gives a uh, or, aggressive, or, yeah, aggressive speech, basically advising you to be a bully and do whatever it takes to win. Right. And yeah, on YouTube you find a whole bunch of people saying, "Do this. This is what you should be doing. This is the life. This is what it takes to succeed in life. You should be doing this," right. which is the opposite your, of what the message was. Sell your soul now. So, yeah. Well, they don't even they don't even see it as selling their soul. They just see it as you know, pragmatism and doing what needs to be done. You know, this yeah. is how the world works. Yeah. So. They do uh, communicate values, movies. That's for sure. Especially uh, American exports. Uh, but uh, from any country, really, they, they'll, they'll communicate cultural values, some of which are universal. Um, I'll, I'll say one thing about um, that. I think it was Aristotle wrote about Plato was sort of like against the experience of plays. Because he thought it was like it could be so persuasive for an audience, yeah. it could almost be like dangerous. Mm. Like, but and of yeah. course, Aristotle would say, "No, this is like the good. This is how you can do drama well." It's a good thing. Mm. Yeah, the difference between propaganda and education, maybe. Yeah, if there's one. Yeah, that's that's a, that's something that's still around today. You know, it's one of those timeless things there's a lot of that and particularly in Hollywood now where uh, the whole sex scandals and racism and stuff where they're trying to include more diversity uh, that sort of thing is happening uh, do you ever see the Enneagram style of the directors or the writers when you're watching the films not just the actors but the so once in a while, uh, but uh, yeah. there are themes sometimes in, in um, someone's work. 
but it's it's a lot easier to see in actors certainly and playing roles i could see it if it was like what is it an auto when it's like jonathan is it an auto when it's both the di when, when, it's, when it's both written by and directed by right then yeah. it might come through because there's a greater degree of control there and it's like i know what the inner themes are from like the writer's point of view and i'm going to set up and direct the, the actors and actresses i'm going to set up the camera shots like show these particular things and then it might come through more hmm. yeah no we've got an aspiring screenwriter with us i was just wondering if all our scripts are going to be fours in the future <laughs> no I just, I just want to encode her and embarrass her at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Miley did uh, read the Robert, heard the Robert McKay thing. Yeah, sorry, Tom. There's some good, there's some good uh, four examples in the movies and some, you know, a lot of stories about uh, love lost and uh, artists also uh, work their way into films. So there'll be a four in them sometimes. Meryl Streep's good at playing four. She's good at playing anything, really. <laughs> yeah, she, can. she goes all over. She goes all over the map. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought. That? Wait. <laughs> no, you. Thought. No, I was Please just thinking it. of a typical type four movie, and I always thought that Edward Scissorhands was very much a type four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Johnny yeah. Johnny Depp, I think, is a type four also himself yeah uh do you did you ever see the movie out of africa i've heard of it i haven't seen it it's meryl yeah. streep and robert redford and she's playing a great four in that one it's in the dialogue it's in her, her manner everything she says the okay actually catherine brought her up in her last videos with her and she actually thinks that she is a type four that's probably a controversial opinion but uh it was being suggested that she's really a four rather than all the other myriad of things she's been taped as. That Meryl Streep is a four? Yeah. Edward thinks that Meryl Streep is a four. That's her opinion. Uh, yeah. Uh, another thing she brought up was she was talking about type fours uh, and they would have to base whenever they have a character, they like to base it on someone else in real life because they're so into their own feelings that uh, it's easier if there's something else. So she suggests like Johnny Depp basing his performance on uh, Keith Richards, for instance, for the Pirates mm -hmm. of the Caribbean and that sort of thing. So have you, have you seen that? Oh, yeah. Have you seen that with fours? Sorry? Yeah. Uh, in the same way that threes can't act, fours make really good character <laughs> actors. And uh, by character actors, I mean they jump, they can do different Enneagram styles that they're not closely connected to. I would, I would submit that um, it also has something to do with the four's capacity for introjection. Because you can take somebody, even if you're not an actor, if you're a four, you can kind of take somebody inside of you and feel like they're with you even when they're absent. And doing that with a role, I think, would be kind of uh, a natural tendency and strategy that a four actor would have. Um, Tom, you said that E3s can't act. Why, why exactly do you think E3s can't act? I think, well, it's kind of a joke, but I think that um, I think the reason would be that they're acting in real life. And so they can't really escape themselves. They're acting for uh, out of a different motivation. They're driven a certain way. And so they, they tend to do, they can have big careers and do very entertaining films, but they don't really, they don't really slip their style very much. Mm -hmm. Tom Cruise did it once in a movie called Risky Business, where he played pretty much a nine. And mm -hmm. He was in a vampire movie one time too, where he played, oh, yeah. he played a three with a four wing. I would say, yeah, it was yeah different. Interview was a vampire. Movie. Interview was a vampire. Is the film? That's it. Yeah, but otherwise, yeah. I, he's he's been a three just right in 
in films where it's really obvious what his character style is, which is most of them, I would say, or sometimes the, the structure of the story kind of reflects a preoccupation with threeness, like you guys were saying earlier. Um, he, he's, he doesn't really vary it too much. Another thing with threes is that they're out of touch with their emotions compared to most Enneagram types, so that kind of limits the that, emotional that's range they can deliver. That's going to be massive for acting because, yeah. like I said, that basically, yeah, that wouldn't matter. It's um, they're great, they're great performers, but not necessarily great actors, yeah. depending on your opinion. So well, you yeah. got to be careful about overgeneralizing it. Too yeah. Much. yeah, there's lots of healthy threes, let's say. And <laughs> they are in touch with their feelings, but they just don't seem to be Tom Cruise or Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> Sylvester yeah. Stallone, or Sharon Stone, or Demi Moore, people like that. So you, so it's like, so you could say that the threes are, and I might be showing a lack of knowledge about the three, but like they're externally focused, the values are external to themselves. They're of society. There's less internal reflection going on and being in touch with their emotions. So That's the tendency within the trance of the style. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it's a built-in set of limitations that you're stuck with for life. <coughs> you can work with them and go beyond them. But that's the tendency within the character structure. Right. So, my OES, yes, you're just working there. Uh, how would you... Since you're trying to be a screenwriter, how do you try and work an Enneagram to your scripts? Do you say? How do you try and work an Enneagram to your scripts when you're trying to write stuff? I know you're just starting out, but... Oh. Well, yeah, I wanted to first figure out the Enneagram of my character, but someone told me to first start with the original idea instead of trying to fit the character into some kind of mold. So, mm -hmm. it, yeah. It might, it might be better for you, Marty, if you think about it. What? If you, if you, because you know you've heard the Robert McKay, you, you quite like the Robert McKay. If you get the book story and think about character arcs, then that will, you can use Enneagram quite well for character arcs because it's all about what they want and quests and growths mm -hmm. and change. That's a good way of going about it. Yeah, it, it could be a good idea to type once you've already got your character and then to deepen yeah, considering the fears and so wait sorry there's some noise in the background right now but yeah, yeah. yeah. well my name is actually quite good for character you think of things like growth types and stress types and that sort of thing like yeah. uh, there's a really good film called Hot Fuzz with Simon Pegg and Nick Frost uh, Simon Pegg's a seven, but he's playing a type one, and uh, Nick was a seven. He's this uh, super cop, this kind of realistic super cop who's very one-ish, and all the other police officers resent him because he's too good at his job, so they kick him out to this whole village. They kick and out what, Simon Pegg or Nick Frost? Uh, Simon Pegg. Simon Pegg, sorry. Simon Pegg's the super cop, he's kicked out of yeah, the Mudded yeah, Force to a lot of village, yeah. And he's partnered with Nick Frost, who's a seven, and Nick Frost keeps encouraging him to get out of his shell and uh, take things less seriously. Uh, and, and Simon Pegg's also giving Nick Frost an arc, encouraging him to be more serious and take his job more seriously as they try to solve the series of murders that they happen to come across. So... Yeah, I think I think you said in your book that a lot of films are, with ones are about them trying to go to to seven, uh, but that's a really good example of it. Not all of them, I would yeah. I wouldn't say that. Yeah, but yeah, but you said a lot. What's you said a lot of them. What was Colin? You said. I said I've seen fifty times. I've seen this where the <laughs> dynamic is between a one and a seven. Yeah, and I think it's because it's photogenic and they're high contrast. 
And the one is, you know, officious and like you're saying about Simon Pegg in that movie. And then the seven is kind of enthusiastic or mm -hmm. excitable or uh, irresponsible. And there's a, there's a conflict. Yeah. Robin Williams used to play sevens all the time. And then yeah. there was one movie where he called Mrs. Doubtfire, where he yeah. played a, a one and a seven. Yeah. He was you know, going back and forth. But they use it a lot, that one. Yeah. Well, on the subject of Robert Williams, uh, there's other films where he does play, he plays ones, he also plays five sometimes, like in uh, the film. Sorry? Yeah. Like in, uh, yeah, like in the, 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 the Insomnia, uh, Christopher what, Nolan's film. And what was it? What was Insom it? What about in Good Will Hunting? What was his type in that? In what? Good Will Hunter. Oh, Good Will Hunting. Good Will Hunting, he may have been a one. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't even think that he, he especially had one in that <laughs> film. He was Robin Williams, but... Okay. Yeah. Well, it was just... Do you see that a lot in terms of uh, actors playing either their core type or one of their lines? Or their wing? A lot. I think... Yeah, a lot. One of their wings, or even a stress and security point. Mm -hmm. And there are some people have who teach the enneagram have trouble with the notion of wings, and yeah. it does seem kind of arbitrary on the one hand. But what convinced me that it was kind of accurate was the way actors will play their core style, and then they'll play their wings, like I was saying before, go back and forth. And it really, it was really obvious with a number of people. Yeah, I don't know why it should be that the that the neighboring enneagram style is a a big influence, but it, it it's really stuck with me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Uh, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, have you ever changed your opinion of certain films? Like you watched it and you thought they were this type, but later on they they change. You change your mind. Um, there's one or two that I have to go. There's two of them I have to go back and look at again from the early days. But otherwise, no. I it I I tried to tried to pick films and roles and actors in films where it was really vivid. For example, if you, there are a lot of films that kind of allude to it, but don't quite nail it. Like if you think of maybe a Godfather movie, mm -hmm. uh, the, the character Marlon Brando plays, he's, he can only be an eight, uh, an eight, eight with a nine wing, but it's not really obvious. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. kind of, he has kind of the king quality that sometimes eights with a nine wing will have, king or queen. And, you know, he's a mafia book don. And there's, there's, there's some things, but I would wind up saying that Marlon Brando in that role is eight-ish rather mm -hmm. than an eight. Yeah. You know, it's kind of there, but not really. So mm -hmm. I would kind of go for the ones where it was really there, where it really kind of kind of hit me pretty strong or, or was just obvious, just jumped out at you. Yeah, what about his other roles? Aren't they well, usually quite eight-ish? Uh, yeah, some of them. Uh, certainly Last Tango in Paris was like that, where he was playing, yeah. a, well, he was playing an asshole, basically. But, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I, think, yeah, I think he said that he really... I don't know if he said that or someone else said that, but they said that he didn't really like that role because it exposed too much of who he really was. Like that was um, actually. I don't know. If, I don't know if the character was like that, but uh, or the the history, the stuff the stuff the character was going through, but uh, that was touching. I on think it. he said it was too painful, and it was it cost yeah. him too much to open up that much. Yeah, uh, he was a, he was a four in real life, but he had an eightish quality. And I believe his father was an eight. In the biographies I've read, the father was a pretty obvious yeah. eight. 
people will carry their parents' Enneagram styles and kind of, uh, it's sort of like wings and stress and security points. You also have those styles within you, in my experience. And so that made a certain amount of sense. And, you know, I think actors can play their parents sometimes if they're, if they're uh, in the right role. Yeah, seeing that in, um, well, I saw that in Doctor Who, I think, where uh, you had one actor who wasn't a particularly good actor, but he was very good at playing Lethbridge Stewart. And uh, because his father was uh, like a major in the army. What was the movie? Oh, it was just Doctor Who, like the old Doctor Who in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. uh, Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it with other people as well. Paul Newman uh, was a six, but when he talked about his father, the father always sounded like a one. And uh, there was a movie called Mr. and Mrs. Bridge some years ago where Paul Newman played a really convincing one. Uh, And I think those those kinds of things are going on in the backgrounds with actors as well. I mean, I think sometimes with with actors, there's like so many different ways of approaching it. Uh, like some are just like super observant and so that with that life experience and other ones just have that empathy thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, and the other ones it's like again it's the emotion memory and all the techniques and all the training like like the actor studio in New York where all the, that particular style mm-hmm. of actor produces good results in my opinion mm-hmm. uh, and that's why, in general, American acting is better than British acting. And then in England, they have like the Shakespearean kind of acting. Like the state, it's more it's from the outside, and it's very technical. And it's about how to talk and project and things like things like that. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, Lawrence Olivier acted that way. He said yeah. that. He- He'd get a fake nose, and he'd get a costume, and then he could get the character. Uh, so he was what? going yeah, from the outside in. One guy that did it really well from the outside in was Gary Oldman. Going Still from does. the outside oh, in, he gets some really good results. Four. There's another four who's really good at a range of roles. Mm. Um, mm. The other, the other ones who sometimes have a ra- a good sized range are nines. Uh, like Alec yeah. Guinness, for example, he was he could do a lot of different things. Mm. Oh yeah, I guess uh, was invisible in his roles. Oh. He could do nines, yeah. he could do threes, he could do eights, uh, yeah. and ones also. Really, all of them equally well. Yeah. See, I know it. I know it's in your book that you said Andrew Hopkins was a five, but I actually think Andrew Hopkins is a nine, uh, based on what I've read about him. He was things like. Uh, he said his greatest weaknesses when he was younger were that he was angry and he was lazy. And he's also said that uh, he's asked how he chooses roles and what choices he makes. He basically says, I just want to work. I don't really care what the role is. I just want to be doing a job. Like He just keeps doing that. And also the one last thing, the, the way he goes into character he says that all he does is he reads the script, then he rereads it, and then he rereads it, and then he rereads it over and over and over again until he gets an impression of the person in his head. Like just that repetition, that falling asleep to yourself to achieve it. So that's my opinion. I remember a quote from Anthony Hopkins that he said it was like a photograph and imagining it, and it becoming mm. clearer and clearer and clearer of the character. Yeah. Uh, the like books that. I read about him were uh, suggested a five, so I don't know. Oh, it's hard to have a discussion about it if we don't yeah. have the same source material. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair enough. So uh, uh, you can think of uh, Hannibal Lecter. That character is definitely. Oh yeah, that's. And we actually yeah. have two people we're in there. Five-ish. We have two people people in there, Bradley and Maria, who are very close on the. Are they a nine? Like Bradley, is, like is somewhere in between. Uh, nine and five. And Maria used to identify as a five, and now she identifies uh, as a nine. Have you any thoughts on that, Maria? On like nine five differences in movies you've seen? 
don't well, think she's... What, do, what do you mean? Well, I mean, like, you may have noticed, like, some differences between, like, Enneagram 9s and 5s, or maybe how they're similar, things like that. Just generally, just say something. <laughs> uh, well, basically, it's it would be the hardest for me to say, because I also have a 5 fix. So I sometimes I, I don't really know if uh, it's where it's yeah. coming from. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, if if you um, Catherine said the correct thing, um, I, I mean, it, it, which was very something that was very true about nines. That they always uh, try to make themselves a little bit more comfortable. That's pretty much about me. And uh, um, if if you always uh, kind of weigh your um, like uh, look um, to see if, if you have enough resources to do just about anything that's more nine-ish. Mm -hmm. yeah. With the, the defenses, the difference in the defenses is that with a nine, you sort of fall for your own defense and you kind of erase yourself and forget that you're that you're there with a five you're usually more aware that you're there but you're holding back and keeping you holding yourself back and maybe watching a situation from a few millimeters uh, or behind your eyes that kind of thing oh, yeah. oh, oh that that's a very good description i i would say pretty much the same i had the, a situation where um, as a kid i was uh, trying to like I, I was in, in some apartment house uh, with my friend looking for some stray kitten that she um, spotted. And uh, she, she was getting out of the, um, like from under the stairway with that kitten. And then um, some mean boy showed up and uh, started uh, picking up a fight with her. And uh, he actually was like hitting her with his feet. Uh, um, and I was just standing there, unaware that I was even present and could do something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. I I still remember that because I, it's how you, you notice this kind of defense. It's mm -hmm. something that haunts yeah, and they're both they're both forms children. of hiding, both with five and nine, but they're hiding in a different way, and yeah. with different motivations. And with five, there's fear running under it, and with nine. Not so much fear as anger. Yeah, um, yeah I also, I, I don't um, really identify with fear as a feeling. I wasn't really afraid of anything, but when I'm stressed out, I lose that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Tom, I've read in, um, may have been Elizabeth Wagley and Lenny Barron about um, the nine resembling other types and they can have like parts of other types. And then I recently read like in NLP about the like the parts model. And so can then that can that be like a useful therapy with like nines, like using that parts technique on them? Um, maybe. You can talk uh, a bit about that. that the, might help. The, usually what happens is a nine will when they're in the process of identifying their core Enneagram style. After they have a first pass at the Enneagram, not always, but but some people, they'll say, uh, well, you know, I identify a little with all of them. And I'm not sure that qualifies in terms of parts exactly. It's more like an identification. And usually the, the parts model comes comes into play after the person is pretty definite about what their Enneagram style is. And then they they start to recognize some of these other connections, for example. Nine has a built-in connection to eight, to one, to three, to six. And then there's the Enneagram style of your parents. You have those somewhere in you too. And that's where the parts model might, might start to become more pertinent. Yeah, there's also why nines are often the, every man in a lot of stories, nines, Nine and six is usually the, it's like if you want a kind of just average Jane or Joe to be your main character, that's usually there. Yeah, yeah and they're, often they're playing the audience too. Yeah. I know from Jonathan that uh, nines and sevens are the most um, 
impressionable in that respect. They can mimic other types if they had a lot of interaction with them. And they can even identify with those styles. Yeah. I've known some nines who were good mimics and mm. uh, maybe some sevens, but I, don't, I think other yeah. styles can do it too. Uh, yeah. So I'm not sure I would, yeah. would uh, take that one too far. Yeah. Well, Another, yeah, another. well, for nines, it, it's kind of um, intuitive because they have uh, looser boundaries mm -hmm. compared to yeah. other types. Yeah. In NLP, they call this second position. And what if they have a little model and they, they talk about three different perceptual positions. And the first one is seeing out through your own eyes from your own position. And the second position is floating over and seeing out through and identifying with somebody else uh, so that you're, you know, trying to, trying to sense them and see the world through their eyes. Nines will do it when they're in their trance and twos will do it in their trance also. And third position is where you're standing back, sort of like a five, maybe floating above the situation or standing Mm. Standing a distance from it and able to able to see all of the elements interacting, but from a from a perspective, a distant perspective. Yeah. Another thing I noticed is that nines make surprisingly good action heroes, uh, or like just the soldier uh, thrust into the situation. Naming mean, it's like a, if the character has certain experience, like I was surprised. To think that Rambo, for instance, might be a nine. Uh, I don't think I was your. That's more. That's my typing. But uh, that he's a just a guy, and especially in the first movie, he's uh, just a guy tried to get by, uh, pass through a town, but he keeps getting harassed, and eventually just snaps and goes in the uh, berserker spree, and the ones tried to hunt him down. And yeah, he also. I mean, you were saying as well that Clint Eastwood is a nine wing eight. That's just. It's it's not a thing that comes across comes off in the descriptions, but uh, that the nines sort are of this nine, capacity. Sort of nine nine -ish, the anger part and the uh, the potential to be quite dangerous if the situation calls for it, but it does show up in movies at times. Uh, uh, Stallone was kind of playing a nine in those Rocky movies. Yes, yeah, as well, definitely. Kind of sympathetic, every yeah. That's more, yeah. That's more obviously, yeah. I'd say Rambo is more of an unhealthy nine, in my opinion. But, uh, uh, the other every man is the six, and I kind, I kind of want to go on a rant now because there's this. Feel free. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> in in Japan, there's this franchise called Death Note, and Ooh. it's very, yeah, it's very, it's very popular. And very recently, they did an American adaptation. Mm -hmm. The problem is that in the Japanese version, the main character is absolutely definitely a one or very one ish. Oh, yeah. uh, but the writers of the American version, they thought he's very interesting, but that seems very strange to us. It doesn't seem very believable or realistic, so we'll make him a six. That seems mm -hmm. to be their whole line of reasoning, and it annoyed quite a lot of people because the yeah, the plot is that uh, he's this high school student who finds a magical notebook that if you write someone's name on it, they die. And when he tries it out out of curiosity, he's terrified to realise it works. Because he's a one, he ends up rationalising it as I was meant to find it. It's good that I found it. I can use this to improve the world and make it better. And uh, he's the kill criminals and evil people when he goes off the deep end. But in the American version, they've made it so that he's uh, he's like his first kill was actually the person who killed his mother, and then he doesn't want to do it until he shares with a a girl and they talk him into doing it. Right. And it's all about more safety and security, like making the world a safer place rather than the original version, which is making the world a a better place, a more perfect place. Yeah, that's a very good example of how the adapt adaptations can uh, change a character. Yeah, and yeah. Inc incidentally, the fa 
almost every single fan of the original story, the Japanese version, hated the <laughs> new version. Uh -huh, yeah. right. It's one of the biggest disasters done there. But, uh, yeah, it's so, got bad reviews over here. Yeah, well, you know about it. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I didn't yeah. see it. I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I, I think they tried to make him more relatable. He's, yeah, they said that. And, and, yeah, but that yeah. didn't work well for the character. Yeah. Yeah. I just, kind of probably. Yeah. yeah. And I just find it interesting that they tried to make him more relatable and they ended up with type six or yeah. I mean, uh, certainly a more six ish character. Four ish six, but still there. Uh, uh, another, another example of. Um, Different people playing the same role would be Hamlet in the movies, and I think I wrote yeah. about it in the book. The yeah. Mel Gibson played him as a six, and Laurence Olivier played him as a four, and uh, what's his name? Kenneth Branagh. No, no, not Kenneth. Kenneth Branagh kind of played him as a six, also. No, the uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. They. David Tennant? The actor who was in... Uh, no, someone else. Yeah, I'm, I'm can, blanking on it. Come to me in a minute. No, I can search over here. There's a, there's a bit in... With Kenneth Branagh's Hamlet, there's a... When he does the speech, Act 4, Scene 4, How All Occasions Do Inform Against Me, I think he plays it wrong. Because I read a, an A-level analysis of the text... The text is supposed to be that it's supposed to be performed ironically because the idea is that Hamlet cannot articulate that uh, the ghost of his dead father might be asking him to do something that would send him to hell because to do so would be to call his dead father a devil. And so he can't articulate mm -hmm. that. And so it's like he doesn't know why he can't act. Well, if he says why he can't act to himself, it's because why can't I act? Because I think my father might be a devil for asking me to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And so it should have been played as somebody. So it was like Shakespeare was like, did something there. And, he, and it comes through in like the, the, the language is ironic. And things like gross examples exhort me. Well, if something is gross, how can it exhort you? Because it's like so it's like little things in the language that sort of indicate that that Shakespeare was trying to do some kind of like unconscious battle in him during that speech. Well, Tom is the actor you're looking for, Nicole Williamson. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you see, he plays him as a one, and it didn't work. As a one, yeah. It was really different, and it didn't really work, but it was interesting. Yeah, because... That's on film, too. Yeah, is that just... Is that just because of the film, or do you think that's the... It just doesn't really work as a one? It's not really written In as general. a one. Yeah. 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 There's too like, much more out. <laughs> There's yeah. also stuff with Hamlet where he's pretending to be crazy off his rocker mm -hmm. so that he doesn't get bumped off. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why they have that thing. I'm as mad as a march. Is it march? But I'm as I know a hawk from a handsaw when it's. So he knows he's a lot of pretending to be mad. Mad as a march here. Yeah. Oh, pardon me. Uh. Oh, Tom, which, which type do you think Macbeth is? Uh, I don't know. I don't, mm. I mean, at least in film, he's not really, mm. he, he, he just comes across as self-doubting, a little melancholic, mm. a little, mm. a little one-ish, mm. but he's well, not, mm. not, really, not really there. Well, I want, I want to see, I, I want to see, actually, I saw the, <coughs> Michael Fassbender version of Macbeth it came out last year or a couple of years ago. That was one of the moments I realised how much Enneagram had just ruined film experiences for me because I got, I was watching this film and thinking, okay, they're this type, they're that type, and so on. I thought, I thought I came across as kind of a six point five, like a yeah, kind of a four is four six point five, yeah, like very melancholy and full with all this kind of doubt and suspicion, more and more paranoid as the film goes on. 
Right. Yeah, at the Wait, have you ever noticed that with yourself? Like you're just watching films and you're getting you no longer I'm watch so them as film, you watch you're watching yeah. them like yeah, you're analyzing them with their Enneagram styles and it's just taking you to the picture. Well, I've gotten to where uh, I'm pretty choosy and also where I'm uh, kind of, uh, I get impatient if the film is bad. I've seen too many films and there, yeah. there seems to be only 27 plus. <laughs> so do anything. Uh, uh, so I turn them off some of the time. But yeah, analyzing it sometimes, or having a really nice element of surprise, where it's like, uh, where it's really there and really clear, and that enhances the film for me, but not necessarily for anybody else. Yeah, and for Robert McKee, the surprise or the plot-based surprise that the character has to react to, and show something about how they can react to it. That's the substance of story for. Rob McKay. So, for example, it, it, so you you have your insight and incident, which sets up the super objective for the film, the goal, the quest, and then as you go towards that super objective, you encounter certain obstacles, and you're faced with certain things. So you take an action, uh, you get an action that you get a reaction that you were not expecting, and it's like, oh no, what do I do now? And then how the protagonist reacts to that set of new circumstances reveals something about their character. Right, and right. Get that interplay of structure and character where deep structure, uh, sorry, deep character and structure are the same thing, interlocked, looked at from different right. points of view. And you can have a contradiction between that and the characterization. So, for example, you can have a thief who is charming, but their deep character is that they're a thief. Or you can have, say, a contradiction at the level of deep character where, say, someone like Macbeth is both ambitious. And he has guilt. So you can have. So Robert McKay, I, I, suggest, I highly recommend the book Story by Robert McKay because it's not just his ideas, it's like built on a tradition of, I think it's the Chicago school of neo Aristotelianism of like, mm -hmm. let's, like let's combine Aristotle's mm -hmm. poetics and then what Stanislavski wrote because it was Stanislavski that came up with like the super objective and all of that stuff. And that is what provides unity to a film, is everything is relevant to the topic of the quest. Right. Yeah, sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Plus, it's a character study. Yeah. But even yes. those, those sometimes they don't have Enneagram styles. Yeah. You, yeah, it's kind of strange. You think you think yeah. they pretty much have to, but somehow the. The writers and the actors and the directors, they're not, it's not what they're sorting for exactly. You can see the difference in, say, a Woody Allen movie or uh, Ingemar Bergman movies. He was sorting for personality in the sense that we would use it in thinking about the Enneagram. Oh, well, if you talk about Bergman, because he's like frequently cited as a deep uh, movie writer. So, do you want to quickly go through any highlights of his films that are showing Enneagram styles? You ever see Persona? No, but I've heard about it in Robert McKee's book. <laughs> I'd say it's about a two and a five, and they, the film is about them turning into each other. Ooh. It's really cool and uh, kind of brilliantly done. That, that fits with a different typology, like Socionics, because, like, but we won't go into that right now, but. People will know where I'm going with that, but could you want to talk a bit about that and people can make their own connections? Uh, talk about the film? Yeah, about the, yeah. Like, how, they, how you think the five and the two turn into each other. Oh, it's sort of complicated within the story. It's not really much of a story exactly. It's more like they are sort of together. It's B.B. Anderson and Lee Volman, and they're, they're together in a remote, it's probably on Faroe Island in Sweden, uh, in a remote house, and they, B.B. Anderson's the two, and she, she gradually kind of gets under the skin of Lee Volman, and then, in a surreal sort of way, the film turns them into each other, and, yeah. and yet it's not science fiction or something occult exactly either. It's more about uh, 
a kind of searing personality study. Yeah, I think that's part of a trilogy he did, sort of unofficial trilogy of films that Bergman did. Um, the other tour. He, here's here's Persona, by the way. I have it. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Good movie. Yeah, Good I found movie. that I found that the actress actually had type four traits as well. Like what you were talking about, the introjection of type four is also yeah in, visible in her. In Lee Volman. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Certainly. Uh, sort of. I mean, the BB Anderson was really clear in that as a two, and then uh, Lee Volman was in, in the five four range, and she was you know re resisting and and had too strong of a boundary and bb anderson had no boundaries you know yeah. Yeah. The dynamic. yeah that's one of the bigger conflicts in real life i find with between twos and fives because fives more than any type want to be alone and twos more than any type want to not they don't want you to be alone they want you to be part of their life and fives can often find them very intrusive in that sense it depends on the individuals yeah, and how it depends, yeah, depends on the individuals but it's a very she's a common criticism i've come across that uh, fives can feel like the twos are intruding on them well uh, that okay yeah. did you ever see the ingemar bergman movie with ingrid bergman it's autumn oh. something autumn sonata yeah autumn sonata that's right uh, she plays a great three in that film. Really a good three. Really a clear three. Inge uh, Ingrid Bergman does. Mm. And there's usually, uh, there's often a one-ish figure in Bergman films. Uh, usually like a, a preacher or uh, somebody mm. representing organized religion who kind of yeah. walks around looking like he's bit on a lemon. You know, and he's got this kind of... Yeah, I think that's... Uh, life-hating attitude that comes yeah. up a lot. I think that's kind of a, his. I think that's his background showing up because, like, he was raised in that. I think his father was a minister or something, and then he grew grew away from it, and it's sort of that. Yeah, the Nietzsche stuff in there as well, maybe. Uh, yeah, but he's a good source, and Woody Allen is a good source, and. I don't know. There's a, f a few filmmakers who are really clued into that, but others not so much, or it's hit or miss. Yeah, like, I've not. I've noticed that Christopher Nolan films. Uh, uh, they're it's actually more of his more recent ones. There's an element of emotional detachment there, and I think he's a five wing six. Uh, I think he might be a five also. The stuff I've yeah. read about him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even just the stuff you see about him in interviews, so that and the. Uh, yeah, it's actually it's kind of weird how it's not as it's, this element isn't as much in his earlier stuff uh they're a bit more character oriented but as he's mm -hmm. kind of like grown more confident he's doing his own thing more and more uh the the dialogue and the way th the way things go are kind of awkward like the the actors are usually really good he lets the actors do their thing give them great performances but the material they have to work with just feels kind of emotionally stunted. Uh, probably the biggest one is like an interstellar where the characters are all, all scientists and they're Anne Hathaway's character even gives a speech in, on love and why it's scientifically relevant and important and it just kind of takes you out of the whole film. <laughs> like uh, that sort mm -hmm. of thing happens. Yeah. Oh. Um, Tom, did you mention, because we did a hangout with Jonathan. We wanted to involve Miley and all get dressed up. For the Batman hangout, so that didn't happen. I just wore the things, the uh, eye pieces, uh, and sort of like some sort of like oh, purple things around my eyes. Is that, a, is that your dress T-shirt? <laughs> my what? Was... Your dress T-shirt. Uh, I don't know. It was just like the uh, the a mask thing. All I could it find. Was... Nice. Yeah, like it a was... beanie ball. Like like. Yeah. Like the Batman villain, the Riddler. That's what he was dressed yeah. up as. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's it. The Riddler. Yes. Um, um, Miley was going to come as a uh, Catwoman, but she didn't turn up. I, I don't uh, think she would. Oh. I don't well, know if she I, only have, I only have the Batman mask. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> oh, there you do have it. <laughs> That's Batman. <laughs> yeah. Just, and so Jonathan is a huge Batman fan. So do you have any thoughts uh, yeah. on various Batmans? Uh, well, you know, different actors play him a little differently, but it always seemed to me like the polarity in that character was between five and eight, mm. sort of back and forth. Uh, but it, there's only some movies, like superhero movies, where it's very obvious what the um, what the superhero mm -hmm. Enneagram style is. And the, in the early Batman movies, Michael Keaton was doing it sort of back and forth between five and eight. Uh, another one I saw that did have a, a, a pretty clear style was Thor. And I haven't seen the recent one, but the first one, it was really obvious he was an eight. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, another, there's a, a very good show on Netflix called Daredevil. Pardon me, it's a superhero show and it's based off a comic. Uh, Daredevil's a one, and that's pretty obvious, but the main, the more interesting thing is the villain. Uh, his arch enemy is a guy called the Kingpin, who is an eight. He's the a powerful crime lord who controls the crime in the West Coast, and the East Coast, and stuff. But in the show, they actually change him so that he's a nine wing eight, and it's a really makes him a much more compelling, if really kind of weird character. When he's a uh, because obviously the character is meant to be an eight, but now he's in a nine wing eight and he's much more shy and withdrawn and uh his right hand man thinks that he's letting all the other gangsters walk over him but he's mm -hmm. saying well it's just i don't want uh he's tried to bring them together and it gets him what he wants which is uh his own piece he's driven by his own peace of mind really and his a really selfish quest for his own peace of mind mm -hmm. and what's interesting is that uh, he has even though he's a nine, for a lot of the time he seems quite like he doesn't seem that of a bad of a person. Every now and then he was snapping and going this really incredibly violent outburst and you know rip, decapitate people and that sort of thing. So it's yeah, that's a good example. It's a good, very good show uh, if you want to find it. And uh, it's a good, it's a good yeah, it's a good example of uh, what we're talking about of how the. Enneagram type can change with the different adaptations and mm -hmm. it just it's always a good example It's a nice rare example of a type 9 villain uh, who yeah, works quite well. That's true. Yeah how do I, Yeah Yeah, the only other type 9 villain I can think of maybe another comic book villain from a It's a there's a film of it, but the comic is Watchmen and the villain Might be a name because he's trying to bring about world peace but he's going to extreme methods to do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I got a phone. Sorry. Um, oh, <laughs> Nobody seems to be talking right now, so I'll ask a stupid question. I heard from Kath um, when Catherine was discussing that um, that she thinks that um, an air type is inherited. I mean, three type is inherited, and the uh, instincts as well. Uh, what is everybody else's take on that? Well, lots of people believe that. Um, I don't personally, but um, I hear it. I hear people say that a lot. Uh, what I, the reason I don't quite believe it is because they they do studies of twins, identical twins, and they find they discover that their genes are identical, but their brains rewire based on what happens to them. So you might be born with a certain temperament and a certain predisposition towards one Enneagram style or a couple of Enneagram styles. And then based on what happens to you, you your, your wiring changes. The, I have twins, identical twins in my family and they don't have the same Enneagram styles, but they have related Enneagram styles. So I think there's, you know, it, that seems kind of appropriate to me that there's a, 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 a kind of built-in connection, but that it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll come out identical. What What do you think about parental influence on in a type? I think that um, it's at least as important as uh, wings and stress and security points. 
in the sense that people carry around their parents. We interject our parents. And you may find that your, you know, some of your reactions have to do with a parent, either reacting as they would or reacting against them as you carry them in your head. And also sometimes what's real, really relevant in working on yourself and growing is recognizing that your parents or a particular parent that you had conflicts with had a different subtype than you do. So you, you grew up uh, comfortable and never wanting for food or shelter. And, but your parents, you know, remember World War II or stories about World War II, and they have a self-preservation orientation that you don't have, but you inherit it, but you don't quite know what to do with it, or you don't express it the same way, or you're conflicted about it, stuff like that. Oh, that I understand very well. Uh, um, there's, a, there's a bit in here that's uh, relevant about a uh, story. I'll just read a little bit of this, and uh, you, you, and it, it seems to hear about what happens with, from the writing point of view of when you look at it, the effect of structure on how a character is and how a character comes across. So the function of structure is to provide progressively building pressures that force characters into more and more difficult dilemmas where they must take more and more difficult risk-taking choices and actions, gradually revealing their true natures, even down to the unconscious self. And then the function of character is to bring to the story the qualities of characterization necessary to convincingly act out choices. Put simply, a character must be credible, young enough or old enough, strong or weak, worldly or naive, educated or ignorant, generous or selfish, witty or dull in the right proportions. Each must bring to the story the combination of qualities that allows the audience to believe that the character could and would do what he does. And then this next bit is uh, very important in my opinion. Structure and character interlocked. The event structure of a story is created out of the choices that characters make under pressure and the actions they choose to take. While characters are the creatures who are revealed and changed by how they choose to act under pressure. If you change one, you change the other. If you change event design, you have also changed character. If you change deep character, you must reinvent the structure to express the character's changed nature. That last part especially is where uh, vivid Enneagram styles tend to show up, where character and story are interlinked uh, pretty thoroughly and the the story is driven by the characters, Enneagram styles, assumptions, uh, beliefs, defenses, reactions, and it's and then it's then it's really pretty clear. Yeah. So, for instance, Robert McKay says that ultimately all stories are character driven, <coughs> but those stories that are the most character driven are, from the point of view of people that are interested in characterization, they are the most interesting stories where the choices are specific to the character rather than just put anyone in this situation and they'll make similar choices right, right. also mm -hmm. uh, you know that character arcs are not just fictional uh, I, I i see them in real people all the time <laughs> as we grow and change in ways that are described by the enneagram you know some mm -hmm. uh three becoming more authentic uh, uh, one relaxing and becoming less judgmental and less held together. Uh, mm -hmm. An eight going from being feeling like the world is a war zone to uh, wanting to make peace, that kind of thing. And they're, um, you know, they're kind of logical, obvious, moderately consistent character arcs in real life. If the person's really working on it, if they're willing and if they're dedicated there are certainly people who go to their graves wondering what happened to them and feeling like victims of their own behavior but when people are really kind of trying to grow and change within a particular enneagram style there's often a, a, a kind of consistency to it that you then see in stories film stories or fictional stories yeah um just I uh, just wanted to point out that there 
I think there's no such thing as a fully fictional character. They all come from reality and the right. writers just have to redress them in one way or another. Right. Or put them in like uh, fully fictional circumstances, but you, know, they, you, you cannot really create what you haven't seen in one way or another. Yeah, they are part of the writer. They are in there somewhere. The writer, <laughs> claim, the writer claims he made it up, but really it's his ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you see Bradley and um, Andrew have bought my <laughs> bought my play, so the character of Wilma is a little bit of a part of me, so they might get an insight. So yeah. from that, yeah, there, there may be a self-made man and a white-made man. <laughs> so, but uh, then when you were reading, it kind of reminded me of mo the movie um, of the Mission. It has really powerful characters. Yeah, and uh, Robert De Niro's kind of an eight in that film, going through a transformation that you would, it's dra dramatized, but that a transformation that you would see in an eight. Uh, how about the, um, the uh, other characters? What do you think? Uh, that was the one that stood out for that one. <laughs> I didn't really see it, see other character styles exactly. Jeremy Irons was a little bit of a one. It's been quite a while since I saw that. Hey, uh, I know a good movie now, or uh, several good movies, if you're interested. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Yep, yeah, we've always been the, in the lookout for good movies. So there's a movie called The Journey, and it's about uh, Martin Donovan and uh, Ian Paisley. It's a fictional movie. It's got... Uh, Timothy Spall in it, and Cole Meany, yeah, and it. it's a little bit romanticized and a little bit corny, but those two guys together are just great, and Timothy Spall is playing Ian Paisley as a one, which I believe wow. is proper, a one with a nine wing, it's really quite clear. Mm. Yeah. There's what's another about? one, what's that? What's, what's that about? Oh, what's it about? Yeah. It's about them negotiating a peace agreement. Oh, oh yeah, that being really polarized yeah. and then coming together. Yeah, yeah, that is okay. That's Skillen, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There's a, a British film from last year called Their Finest. Did you hear of that one? It's as vaguely familiar. But, uh... It was about a, a radio, I think, in World War Two. Mm-hmm. And it has a uh, one of the main characters is a real clear one in that. And there's a uh, and the imitation game. Have you seen yeah, that? I've seen some of it. Yeah, pretty clear five that one. And yeah. Benedict Cumberbatch, I think, is a five, and he sure plays him a lot. Mm, I don't know if he's a five in real life. He's uh, he does play a lot of fives though. Uh, yeah, although I will I will say that. As a, as a historical note, since like the, the imitation game is not historically accurate, no, <laughs> that's just no. a little tidbit. Turned out it was only a movie. Yes. But, but the character was a pretty pretty clear five, yeah. and you don't see those a lot. Yeah. You don't see movies sure. built around them very often. Yeah. Well, 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 no, it says with the, the imitation game and also with the film The Social Network. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're both based in fives in real life, and they're right. much more socially off awkward on film than they were in real life. Uh, that seems to be the trend. Like Mark Zuckerberg saw it and just kind of thought, <laughs> yeah, it was not at all what he was like, but nonetheless. No, yeah. yeah. Can you name any films in which nines may uh, like do a lot of personal growth? Uh, There's a movie called Patterson, which has Adam Driver in it. Or mm -hmm. Adam Driver from the Star Wars movies. Yeah. And that's a that's a good film. And he's playing a nine. Yeah. It's a Jim Jarmish film. Uh that's that's a recent one. Um let's see what else. There's a film I would really recommend called Grandma with Lily Tomlin. 
and it's a, about two or three years old, and it's got an eight, a nine, and a one. And they're all kind of coming to resolutions of various kinds. And it was it's really a good film. It's just kind of uh, very, very obvious what the Enneagram styles are, too. Uh, I'd have to look at my book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to remind myself of other how, how about sixes? Also, a um, question about personal growth in movies. Let me get my book. <laughs> well, my, my, you, you can see um, I, yeah, I just wanted to say oh, that I, I find uh, nine protagonists often not making much growth <laughs> or doing <laughs> much personal development. Like, for well, instance, the big that, Lebowski. <laughs> Is a nine. Um, the dude. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. a typical well, nine. That's a satire. Well, more than typical. That's a satire of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think in Tom's book there was like, um, I think there was shipping news mentioned, right? Yeah, shipping news. Yeah. Unfortunately, Kevin Spacey. Yeah. <laughs> Some of Kevin Costner's movies are, are that way. And also, yeah. uh, the movie Paris, Texas, that has Harry Dean Stanton in it. Yeah, that's that's a great film. Yeah, it is a great film. And also, there, he's in one. He just died, but he made a film right before he died called Lucky. And he's he's like that there too. And uh, there's there's some growth in that film, I would say. Uh, I would say maybe like the films uh, directed by um, Ozu, the Japanese director from like mid 20th century. He has a lot of um, protagonists who maybe nines or sixes, I think, perhaps. Like Tokyo so, Story. Right. Movies like that. Yeah. Uh, because, li like, um, I, and it said. Uh, it, it was absolutely right that there's a lot of nines in movies, but they don't don't do much of anything. Mm. Well, well, sometimes they're 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 not really obvious because they're playing the audience. But sometimes the yeah. character really is obviously a nine, and uh, and then there's you know that that has something to do with story structure, for example. Um, some. Would there be nines in the female characters in more of like the family dramas where it's showing a woman who's sort of in a trapped situation and sort of like rather than as an active character, more like yeah, those kind yeah. of mini plot type of thing there's a movie called one true thing with meryl streep yeah where she's pretty 90 and she's trapped and that's what it's about yeah. is the, the the trap of her life yeah because, because otherwise like most protagonists it's like you got to get them to like again to go on this quest and to get <laughs> a nine to go on a quest it's gonna be difficult it's going to have to make no, there are stories, there are yeah, stories where someone well, goes on locked in yeah. the quest. Isn't, isn't Frodo and Lord of the Rings a nine? Yeah, but Lord of the Rings. I don't know Frodo. Like, I know that. Bill. Bill. <laughs> but he's going oh, on a quest. Okay. okay, two things. Firstly, Ben, no. Silence, Ben. It's not bad. It's wonderful. <laughs> Secondly, I actually think Bilbo Baggins from The Hobbit is a better example of a nine. And uh, he's a better example of that sort of plot where. Uh, he doesn't really want to go on a quest. He's quite happy with his life, but then Gandalf and then the dwarves thrust themselves into his life and make a mess. And Gandalf really impresses Bilbo that what happened to you, man? When you were a kid, you were much more adventurous. You had more dreams. And uh, that's what convinces Bilbo to go on the quest with uh, the dwarves and get the prison back because he's Basically, he is living the nine dream. He is sitting around his house all day long, doing nothing. I mean, day of his life, he needs to do something more. He needs to go out there and achieve because otherwise he's going to die and having done nothing. So 
The Hobbit is a good example of. It's not a great film. It's not a great series of films, uh, yeah. uh, at all. But uh, it's a good example of that sort of thing. I'm not sure what Frodo is. I don't know if he's. If Frodo's a nine, he's not the same type of nine as Bobo. Uh, but the question is whether it's really in the film or not. Well, it's really. It's really in the film with the Hobbit. Certainly, that that part is done well. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't blame you for not seeing the Hobbit films because they're not good. <laughs> but, <laughs> I saw. I saw one. It seemed like it was for fourteen-year-old boys. So I kind of didn't, didn't quite get <laughs> no. through it. No, it, it says in the chestnut book that uh, like w which is the direction of growth for each type, and uh, it kind of describes what where you're supposed to go. But I haven't really seen real life stories about it. Yeah. Which well, well. A good example for name would be Rocky, which uh, is about Rocky's growth from nine to three, where it's about uh, he's down in his luck, he's working part time jobs, he's kind of a lightly involved as a mob enforcer. He's not very good at it; he's too nice. And then the opportunity to uh, achieve and trace us, trace but off. To become a great boxer and the heavyweight, fight the heavyweight champion of the world, uh, that comes along, and because he's a nine, he's very good at just falling asleep and doing a ton of hard work and uh, working his bum off until he's fully trained and surprisingly puts up a much better fight than he would be expected to. So, yeah, the Rocky films are really all about a nine moving to three, and one of the recent ones, Rocky Balboa, he's even got a kind of, a son who's kind of three-ish or six-ish, and he's complaining about uh, his his dad's embarrassing in front of his friends, and Rocky tells his son a huge epic speech about uh, your, Rocky gives the speech to his son that uh, his son's wasting his life trying to fit in with people we should more ambitious and driven he's got to want it and need it and work his ass off and uh, don't ever go up with your dreams so that's all a good example um, of a character who's been around since the 70s uh, even to the present day of his journey from 9 to 3 So Tom, apparently a lot of people don't know is that Sylvester Stallone actually wrote the film Rocky and like he, yeah. he actually said look and he made it a condition on selling the script because everyone wanted the script. All the studios wanted the script. They're like, you've yeah. got to have me in this film playing this part. So, Tom, how much of the character, how much of, like, of still Sylvester Stallone's type is in that film, do you reckon? How much of his own? Well, it, it, the research, the stuff I read about Stallone pretty much described a three with a four wing. Hmm. And... Um, He's got a, he'd have a built-in connection to nine. Maybe it's in his tri-type. And um, I thought that he was, you know, kind of writing about his situation, too, as a starving yeah. actor. You know, kind yeah, of, there was a sort of Cinderella That's, story. That got, yeah. he, but actually, the first film was a very good film, too. Yeah. The Rocky, it really hurt. Uh, Rocky, the sixth film, the last film, Creed, the... But it does, another story about uh, Sylvester Stone is that he was so starving that he ended up selling his dog to have food to make money. And oh. when he, when the script for Rocky was picked up and he got his paycheck, very first thing he did, he went out and bought his dog back. Uh -huh. um, I remember at the time, uh, not so much at the time, but uh, there were reports about the rivalry between Schwarzenegger oh, yeah. and Stallone. But like they were friends with each other, and they got involved. I think it was like Hollywood Planet, and I think like they're both like Republicans, and uh, I think they're friends now. Yeah. But they oh. may have been. I think some there may have been some competition over Bridget Nielsen as well. Initially, they may have been both data. Yeah, there's no accounting for taste. <laughs> well, she looked pretty good there, Bridget. <laughs> no. Yeah, there's sort of a 
they joke about it now. There's sort of a friendly rivalry, but back in the day, they were really super competitive, and you see that with younger threes and uh, in that sort of environment, they're super competitive at the time. But then, once the competition's over, they're a bit more relaxed. Uh, there's actually a, res- a wrestling example. If you think of the actor Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, who's very three-ish, when he was a wrestler. Mm-hmm. He was in that situation where he was uh, very competitive and a lot of the guys around him were very competitive and they were having a lot of real... Obviously, wrestling's fake and story-driven, but all the stories were heat, the real-life rivalries backstage, and uh, things did at times get personal and sometimes violent. Uh, but now there's more... They're looking back on it and just saying, man, what crazy days those were. Yeah. Yeah. Different. Yeah. Yeah, The Rock would be another example. He can kind of act a little bit, but yeah, he, he, can, yeah. he, would follow, he would follow my three paradigms. Yeah, I mean, like, and he was alert. I mean, the thing is with wrestling, there is a definite meta level in there for people who know it's fake. Oh, yeah. Like, it's like everyone knows it's fake now. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's it's got to the point now that uh, they're actually writing stories almost uh, fans knowing what the joke is and all that like uh, oh, yeah. like the the last couple of years last few years the the guy that would <coughs> there's always a wrestler who the, the company thinks is the guy that's going to be our our poster boy and it used to be Hulk Hogan and later on it was Steve Austin and The Rock the last couple of years, it's been uh, a guy called Roman Reigns and before him, John Cena. And both those guys are hated, hated by the so many fans. Oh, yeah. Because the fans know, know damn well <coughs> that the company is pushing them. And the company basically exploits this by shoving them in their face so much. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's almost a really weird war going on between the fans and the company. As far as it's wrestling really goes. Good. Really interesting. Yeah. And like and yeah. you had you had a guy on there who was a commentator called John Bradshaw Layfield. Oh yeah. Uh, but he's he's, a, he's like that in real life. But but in real yeah. life he is a really a rich businessman who's like really smart. He's like a smarter version of the guy who does when yeah, he's a commentator. He's, uh, it's weird. Yeah, he's <laughs> yeah, that guy's an eight as well. He's a uh, and, Vin, and Vince McMahon, the guy who runs the company, he's an eight as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's so many weird. That would be that would be a totally different hangout as well to yeah, go into the personalities of wrestlers because yeah, there's so is, much. I'd I'd have to study up on that one. Yeah, but, I remember I once asked one of the, what I asked. Uh, well, I, I asked one of the divas, and she said that the good at remember that the, 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 it's not so much they remember their lines as they have bullet points of certain points they have to make in their right. interaction. So they're right. usually very good because that's a live performance. That's, imp- that's improvisation. Yeah. Well, it's not improvisation anymore. Nowadays, they've got people in their ear telling them everything, no matter what. It's because because it's much more televised and uh, t- social media, and now everything's hyper scrutinized. Oh well, you see, the thing is, they have these like they have their, they have these. I mean, that's like the Premier League, and before that, you have all the little leagues. Yeah. So it's like in order to get to that Premier League, you've got to be good. And again, it's a temperament well, thing where someone's a natural improviser, where they're, they're good at doing the jive talk, the, 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 the uh, jive interaction with each other. And, yeah, but um, yeah, but that's like back in the day, it used to be much more improvised, whereas nowadays, uh, it's a lot more scripted. Like uh, that's been a complaint from fans. Yeah, people. Yeah. But it anyway, again, but... when they have, when they have an argument, they talk yeah. for about three minutes, and the other person never interrupts. <laughs> so I'm only I'm I'm kind of time budgeted to okay. uh, quarter after the hour. Yeah, okay. uh, that was a pretty good. Go pretty pretty good hangout, anyway. So. Yeah, that was good. We co- I made a little note. We covered most of the. I think we covered nearly all of the enneagram types. I think maybe we were a little short on the seven. I'm not sure. We were talking about Robin Williams a lot. Yeah, yeah, we thought that. Yeah, but we did. And my my just just for the audience, my Leah was kicked out. She wasn't. She didn't leave. Yeah, it wasn't me. I didn't. Yeah, she's 
We may have been short on the two because we did mention something about Persona and the Titans, but I don't know if we mentioned any yeah. other holds or twos. Um, I had a quick question uh, if I could ask. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, what Enneagram type would you say he is? Was it well, I think, I think he was four. Hmm. Hmm. He seemed to be very uh, able to like play a variety of roles. Or yeah. it seemed like. Yeah. We were talking earlier about uh, at least a belief of mine from having done this research that uh, fours make pretty good character actors in that they can jump their style and kind of interject other styles and have a bigger range than some other, some other actors. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So yeah, you want to wrap things up? Okay. So I'll, uh, it's, it's a uh, goodbye from me. Yeah. Oh, the, well, first, first of all, the, the book is, Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The book is the Enneagram movie and video guides by Tom Condon. is quite interesting. About uh, of Amazon, whenever it's on uh, Amazon and, uh, as an ebook. Yeah, yes. and that's high price from Jonathan. He's an E one. He is very hard to play. So quite interesting. as high price from him. Uh, I don't think I'm that hard to please, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and. Uh, my Leah wants to say that she had technical difficulties, that's why she yeah. wasn't there. Yeah, but uh, so yeah, that's the book. Uh, always a pleasure. Thanks for the conversation. Well, uh, same so, place, same here. Thank you. Oh, so, okay. right. Bye bye. Hope Goodbye. to see you some again. Gentlemen, see you, everyone else. Yes. Okay. Okay. I've got to go because okay. I'm freezing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Stop. Right.